Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Kara Solomon, and I am the founder and executive director of Everyday Boston. And on behalf of all of us at Everyday Boston, I'm so happy that you're joining us for the second part of our conversation um, in uh, on the Cradle to Prison Pipeline, um, featuring three men that I work with and admire, uh, and I'm proud to call my friends. So those three men are Armand Coleman, Dana Brown, and Noble Williams. Um, for those of you, I'm just gonna give a little bit of a background. For those of you who don't know Everyday Boston, we are a nonprofit that connects neighbors across a divided city through the sharing of stories. Um, so we really believe that in order to bridge some of these really deep divides in Boston and really across the, the country, um, everyone needs a couple things, right? We need uh, listening and communication skills, and then we need opportunities to connect. So through story-focused programming, that's what Everyday Boston provides. And we, we do that in neighborhoods and we do it in schools and we do it in workplaces. And we also do it in prison and, um, and in reentry programs through uh, a project called the Bridge Project. Um, and this is, uh, this is a program that was created in partnership with formerly incarcerated people. And it's really designed to help strengthen um, the listening and communication skills of, of people inside prison and people coming home and also strength, strengthen their connection to the community um, through story collecting projects and story share events, um, among other things. So um, the program was, was inspired and largely shaped by one of the founding members of our team. Um, his name is George Powell, and he um, has, had been out of prison for about six months when he joined Everyday Boston. A lot. Proved completely found, you know, he's, he's basically transformed Everyday Boston with his, with his insight and wisdom. And then um, several, I would say maybe about a year ago, we had the complete pleasure of having Armand come on board. Um, as our first coordinator for the Bridge Project. Um, and this was, you know, a few months out after he'd come out of prison and he uh, hit the ground running and just has made a, a huge impact on, on the Bridge Project and on Everyday Boston. Um, and uh, co-led a story collecting project within months. Um, Ashton, close your door. Oh, <laughs> listening to people who haven't, can you just, can everybody just press mute if you can? Um, thank you. Uh, so Armand co-led co a story collecting project um, at Northeastern with Northeastern Center for um, Public Interest uh, Advocacy and Collaboration. I think I got that right. Um, they were doing a project on the cradle to prison pipeline. And so we jumped in with a story collecting project. Um, and that was the inspiration for this series. Um, so so that has been Armand's, part of Armand's very large contribution. Um, and he introduced uh, both Dana and, um, and Noble to Everyday Boston. I just want to say a couple words about um, more recently, uh, this past fall, uh, Noble, uh, who just is relatively new to Everyday Boston, jumped right in and started facilitating. He facilitated story share events with neighbors across the city. And he, he also was one of several members of the Bridge Project to, um, to support a story sharing event with senior citizens um, on the topic of intergenerational racism. This was something we did in partnership with Councillor Campbell. Um, and last but not least, Dana, has been just powering the Bridge Project forward um, for the past several months, doing uh, amazing work, interviewing COVID survivors, supporting a story collecting project between teens and seniors, um, and also is really leading the way on our insider's guide to coming home, which is gonna be a really a practical um, story focused um, guide by returning citizens for returning citizens. Um, so basically, I, I just feel very honored and um, to, to have these men and so many others um, involved in the Bridge Project because their natural community building skills um, have strengthened the organization exponentially. Um, so I want to thank them in advance for sharing their stories. I also want to briefly shout out um, our co-sponsors. Um, we are we are honored to have Transformational Prison Project as a as a co-sponsor. Armand is now the director of this organization, which is fantastic. So he has moved on from Everyday Boston and taken taken the lead on this organization. Um, we are also very honored to have the African American Coalition Committee at MCI Norfolk um, as a co-sponsor. 
uh, as well as the Crystal Lens, which is amazing, and also Northeastern Center for Public Interest in Advocacy and Collaboration. I got that right. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to somebody who I love and admire. Um, her name is Crystal Chandler. She is an educator, an activist, a multimedia producer, and thankfully, um, a board member of Everyday Boston has been with us from the very start. So um, without further ado, Crystal. Thank you, Kara. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you all, everyone, for um, joining us tonight. I absolutely love, love, love Everyday Boston. Um, I've actually personally been riding with Kara for how long, Kara? Since like 2015? Since the start with George. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Everyday Boston has definitely, you know, been doing good work. You know, like all organizations, life is a roller coaster, right? So we just kind of like ride the wave. So definitely, definitely happy to be here for sure. Um, I just want to let folks know, in case you missed the first event, you can find it on the Everyday Boston YouTube channel. Um, you can tap in with us there and just see what the first event was all about, right? And see what stories came out of that. Um, and that one was more focused on schools, right? Um, and just how school was impacted by the, the Cradle to Prison pipeline. So definitely check that out. And just to reinforce for this evening, again, our theme is prisons, right? Prisons and police, right? And we're going to talk to these three men and y'all just in for a treat per usual. So definitely, definitely, definitely excited for that. Um, I actually want to pass it over to Noble because um, I know we started a little bit behind, but it's all good. I'm going to pass it to Noble and he's going to actually tell us a little bit about the grounding exercise we're going to do. I'm actually going to lead y'all in a grounding exercise. And um, it actually came up almost, you know, by by accident, um, you know, Armand on our last call was like, I want something inspirational. Tell me something, you know, tell me something good. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. I was like, I don't know if the sun is shining. I woke up this morning. <laughs> um, and we kind of, uh, you know, got into grounding and started talking about like affirmations and stuff like that. And the conversation was really awesome and really deep. So we decided to bring that same practice here uh, to start this evening. So I'll pass it to Noble if you want to kind of give us an overview and then I'll do the grounding exercise after. Uh, no problem. Definitely a pleasure. So grounding is an exercise. It could be a breathing exercise. It could be a quote. It could be a reading. And um, the purpose of the grounding is really just to center, center yourself. The, um, a lot goes on throughout the days, throughout the weeks, to really just reconnect with your mind and your body. Just bring yourself down to relax yourself. And sometimes it's good in the morning to get that blood flowing, get that energy going. And I actually learned how to do grounding inside the prison on um, doing restorative justice work. So just picture like a um, bunch of men in the own. Um, in, a, in prison where it's chaotic every single day and really having the opportunity just to like shut the music off and just to calm your body and just calm your thoughts and really just focus on the here and now. So ground has been very um, helpful in my transition in my life, just to ease myself to just to slow things down just for a second out the day. I really um, feel like we do reserve, this is a second out the day, even if it's two minutes, it's to take to yourself and just like, like, like and so right now, I'll pass it to you, Crystal, so we can go through on what a ground feels like and look like. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So when everyone, wherever you're at, just kind of get comfortable in your chair, you're sitting on the floor, wherever you're at, um, and just kind of just, you know, just be, just be for a minute, right? Just be present. Yeah, I mean, we live in a world where we're kind of told to operate, you know, in the past and worry about the future back and forth, but let's just be present. All right, so if you want, you can close your eyes. Um, you can also turn off your camera if you wanna, you know, have more intimate time. You don't want folks looking at you, it's all good. We are all family here. Um, but just take a deep breath in through your nose. Breathe deeply, breathe deeply, breathe deeply. And then you wanna hold at the top and then you're gonna exhale. All right, and if you want, you know, just take a notice of where your body is at. You know, are your feet flat on the floor, right? Are your legs bent? What are you feeling? I, I feel my arms are on the side of, you know, my chair, right? Just be present in this moment. And take one more deep inhale through your nose. In deeply if you can, hold at the top and then exhale through your mouth very slowly. 
I'm gonna go through our list of affirmations um, while you all practice your breathing just like that. So just keep that nice slow breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. And you can just listen to the sound of my voice. Today, I practice self-compassion. I forgive and accept myself. I accept and love myself unconditionally. I choose forgiveness, compassion, and healing for myself and for others. I'm in control of my life. Everyone can see you, that would be awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone just take another deep inhale as we continue, exhale. So you can kind of get back into your grounded space. And I'm gonna stop from the top again for y'all, all right? I practice self-compassion. I forgive and accept myself. I accept and love myself unconditionally. I choose forgiveness, compassion, and healing for myself and others. I am in control of my life and its direction. I am in the driver's seat. I inhale confidence and I exhale fear. I let go of the need to punish those whose words and actions have hurt me. I let go of my need to hold in the tears when they need to flow. I honor my emotions by leaning into them rather than fighting them. Emotions are an indicator that I am here, I am alive, and I am a human with feelings. I let go of all the hateful thoughts about myself and others one at a time. I forgive myself for the way I treated myself in the past. I am worthy of self-compassion and I practice patience with myself. I am loved unconditionally and beyond comprehension and that's okay. I decide what I should or should not take personally and how I should react. I forgive those who have harmed me in my past and peacefully detach from them if I choose so. My strength is demonstrated not only in my moments of bravery, but also in my moments of vulnerability. I will be attentive to recharging my mind, my body, and my spirit as much as I recharge my phone and all those other electronics. The answer to the external validation I seek is already inside of me. Self-love and community love rejuvenates me and gives me the energy I need to keep going. And last but certainly not least, I have come this far and I can and I will keep going. Let me read that one more time. I have come this far and I can and I will keep going. Ashe. So if you want, you could just take a deep inhale through your nose. Hold at the top. Exhale. And whenever you're ready, you could bring yourself back into the space. I don't know if you, some folks say, you know, say thank you, say Ashe, Namaste, Amen, um, Shalom, you know, whatever it is that works for you. Um, so, ooh. All right, how's everyone feeling? Can I get some like fingers? If y'all are able, feeling good? Feeling good? Feeling grounded? Yeah, I like fingers. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So we're gonna hop right into it. Um, and I'm actually gonna start with Noble. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, his story. And Noble, I don't know if you wanna kind of talk a little bit about um, you know grounding and that specific exercise and just kind of bring us into you know, your experience, you know what I mean, um, with the prison and the police system. And we'll take it from there. All right, no problem. So thank you for that ground. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, just like a two minute ground and breathing exercise, like how, what it does to the body, like what it does for the mind. It, it really helps a lot with my own, my anxiety. Um, throughout the day, helped me to really just focus on myself, to center myself. Mm -hmm. And um, in the prison environment, it came in very um handy. At the beginning, at first, it was um, introduced to a ground. I was a little nervous, like closing your eyes in prison. It's like you don't want to do, right? And it's more that the process went on, the more that I realized that I was really just starting to become one with myself. 
Mm-hmm. And um, that experience, I would say the experience, we could talk about, I'll go to my first contact and then what's led me yeah, absolutely. on my path, right? So my first, I was born and raised in Boston. Um, I grew up in an environment, um, wasn't the best where I felt more safe running the streets. I, I felt my own household. And um, I, I was in elementary. And um, me and my mother went to a friend's house. And her, her friend was murdered in front of both of us. And I, I, was, I was a baby at the time. And um, we went to the police station. And as, as, we, as we're sitting there, I'll never forget, like, they, they got like a photo book like have me going through books to see like oh do you know who did it and I'm, a, I'm like eight nine years old right and um asking me that I know what's going on and just like interrogating me and I'll never forget I'm looking I go through a section of books it's all clowns so I start laughing like look look at all these clowns they're all in the book and on um, the police came like this ain't no effing gang someone just murdered look in the effing book and let me know if you can find who did it and from there, I shut down. I shut down. And ever since then, it was just like, I really didn't want nothing to do with that, with them, with that whole system in general. And I never um, had no one to talk to for mental health. I just seen something traumatic. And the main focus was, um, let's find the person who did it, not caring what me and my mother just witnessed and went through, like walking over a dead body, blood everywhere, and we're seeing it. And you were eight years old, you said? Yeah, I was in elementary. I was like, like around eight, nine. I was very young. And so that's your first interaction with, you know, police, right? And it's, you know, really harsh and aggressive and felt really, like from what you're saying, it felt kind of hostile given the situation, right? That y'all just lost somebody. Um, talk to me as, you know, so you're eight now, right? And talk to me, walk me through the years, right? And all the different interactions that you had with police and just kind of how does that shape you? Um, and then we'll kind of, we'll get into like the prison side after. So the way, so after I we came home, it was like, like it was never talked about as if like it really never happened. And um, like in the neighborhood, I seen like how to interact with, you know, um, I grew up in the project. So people getting pulled over, stopped um stopped and search and as i got a little older i say 12 13 i had like a little well, a little dirt on my face you know <laughs> you coming in right you a big yeah, a little now. son right so Absolutely. in, in their eyes it was more like i was a grown man so mm-hmm. it was it, like it became normal like stop um was even out the project, going to dudley going to dorchester it was always um just always being pulled up on stop searched um, empty out the pocket, sit on the curb, which it became like a, it became something normal. You um, became desensitized to yeah, it. Yeah, definitely desensitized. We're like, okay, let me see how many days, how many times I get pulled over today, or I get stopped today, to the point they got so used to me, they just pull your shirt up. You got no guns, you got no weapons. And that was just, it was normal. It was like desensitized to it. And that just became my interaction with them. Mm-hmm. It was never really a, how you doing? How was your day? And I understand everything around me is going on that I probably I'm in a violent, a violent environment, but it don't mean that I basically I fit every description of if anyone committed crime, I fit I fit I fit all those descriptions. Yeah. Even if they had on they wearing all blue, I got on all black, I still fit the description. Yeah. So that was just really just my relationships like as the years went by. So talk to me a little bit about um what that like what all those interactions did for like the development of your childhood, right? Cause like, I know exactly what that's like, right? When um, the adultification of young, you know, black children, it happens, right? It's happened to me, you know what I mean? In different ways, clearly happens to you. So talk to me about that, right? Because oftentimes I find that um, your childhood, right? Like the development doesn't actually go in, in the way that, you know, just uh, the at quote unquote average, right? Like adolescent would be able to just naturally develop. So talk to me a little bit about that. Well, um, so for me, how it developed me, I felt alone, felt unsafe, right? I felt like I had to take um, matters into my own hand because I knew where I couldn't go to them for any assistance. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up in a household where me and, mother, me and my mother was abused by my stepfather. So when I got to the age to fight back, I fought back. Um, as far as um the way to, to please interact with my community and as well as myself, I, I decided to take matters into my own hand. 
because I can't depend on them. And when you really think about it, they need to take on wear vests, um, guns, cuffs, all these things they need to have to um, equip themselves to go to my neighborhoods. And I live in those neighborhoods. So how you, you think what I have to do to protect myself when they just coming by and I'm living so I've been in survival mode, like with the joy of my life. So that's what it shaped, it shaped me to like, I have to protect my mother, protect my family and protect myself. And I know I can't go to them for any um, aid assistance, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I hear you, I definitely hear you. Cause I think that's, it's such a big thing, right? Where we have to make this decision, right? Do I call this, you know, law enforcement entity, you know what I mean? Who maybe they'll help, maybe they won't. You know what I mean? Um, they've demonstrated to you that, you know, they profile, right? They demonstrated to you with their interactions that, like you said, like you just fit the description, right? Like that they, right? It wasn't actually that they were looking for like the suspect, right? They were just looking for someone to fit the description to fill it, right? Um, so I definitely hear you, right? Because that's such a big thing. And uh, I hear that from a lot of folks that I work with, where it's like, yo, I'm protecting my family, I'm protecting, you know, like my neighborhood, I'm protecting my friends, because we are not afforded the same protections that are quote unquote promised by, um, you know, the protect and serve, like by the law enforcement. Um, so thank you for that. So walk me now uh, to so like a little bit about life behind bars, right? And like, I know you talked about like the grounding exercise and maybe if you wanna talk about like the, the juxtaposition, right? Of like, you know, maybe the, the, the environment of the prison and then, you know, just kind of how you, you work that grounding into it. So um, I would say like every single day in my life sitting in prison, I was really traumatized. Mm -hmm. So it was nothing about the experience that would have made me say, yeah, I'm responsible for committing the crime. I'm never going to do it again. It's the complete opposite. Um, so the violent me, me going into prison, um, being told what to do, um, when to wake up, when to sleep. Um, the most dehumanized um I had to deal with is the strip search, mm -hmm. where the strip search was um at, actually weaponized against us. Mm -hmm. Like so, they upset. The seals upset with me. All right, well, strip, I'm searching. Strip search. So I got to take everything off, all my clothes. And I got to stand there, um, even if I have another um, person in the cell with me. Well, you turn your back, you search, search take everything off, mm -hmm. take your clothes, they throw it to the side. Um, you got to swap cough, and then after they do that, then you got to walk over and pick your clothes up off the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that was the um, everyday giving, right? On um, the way that you um, you treated, race definitely plays a um, major part in there as well. So um, I never had the opportunity to really sit back and think about the crime I committed because I'm back in, um, in survival and being in prison, they really don't feed negative um, positivity. Mm -hmm. So the CO's administration also feed that negative, the way they talk to you, the way they treat you, they don't want you to do good. So um, stomping the cross with still the justice gave me the opportunity to really like focus on myself and really do my own self healing and self work yeah. and grounding really was something that helped me just shut the world out right and really just not focus on what's going on around me and i, I do ground as a lot it's more to um, reflect on myself where i've been and where i'm heading mm -hmm. so that yeah that experience I, um, i'm going on a year home after 10 years on March 24th, be a year home. Awesome. Listen, congrats. Let's give him some snaps. Okay. It's coming up. All right. Again, absolutely. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yes. We love to hear it. So yeah, I, I love that you talked about like, you know, really doing like that self-work because a lot of people say, right? Like the quote unquote, the purpose of prison, right? Is to rehabilitate folks, right? We're supposed to rehabilitate folks and get them back into society, right? But what I'm hearing from you, and obviously we know this, that it's, that's not what it does, you know? That's not what it does at all. So, you know, I'm, I'm A, happy to hear that you found grounding work. And, you know, if you just wanna share a little bit about um, your, your, your self-discovery journey, right? With the grounding work and what would that have meant for you to have this, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, right? Like, you know, when you were a kid, when you were eight years old, right? You know, when you had that first interaction with the, the police at the station. So talk to me about that. Um, so RJ, we still just play a major part. With, um, we learned how to do groundings, check-ins, you know, how to process myself. So let's just, just go back to when I was eight years old and 
me witnessing um, a man be murdered right in front of my face. And I think from that from that point, it should have been how you feeling. Oh, you might need someone to talk to. Let me um, check back in with you. Mm -hmm. And let's let's follow up with this young man, or this young, with this, with this child. Mm -hmm. just a child. Let's use the right yeah. word, child, right? Yeah, like, like actually, just, yeah, absolutely. I, I just witnessed this um, traumatic experience that might affect him for the rest of his life. Right. So I, if you I, had that, you know what I mean? Like, what do you think the trajectory of your life would have been if someone had like intercepted you and said, you know what I mean? And actually did that work with you, like as an eight-year-old, right? Like, what would that have looked like for you? Oh, it would have been out of self-confidence, self-love, um, not living, not living in fear, being like living in survival, mm -hmm. right? To um being in survival mode and just not feeling like you're by yourself and no one um so it would have helped me really to um to how to speak how to um express myself and um knowing that this helps so knowing how to seek help like well, I grew up help didn't exist so it's not like you know somebody got programs out there oh I don't just go find a program it don't exist mm -hmm. so if you don't know what that what what those things are how can you go search for them right so you don't know it exists how are you supposed yeah. to find it? So it would have been life changing because um maybe me, me my mother would have had a better um relationship at that time. She probably didn't know how to communicate with me um better at that time and mm -hmm. and so forth. And that that would have changed a lot. It would have changed. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um you know, it does take a lot to to do the work, right? To kind of understand your story, to understand you know, your journey and to do like this self-healing work, right? Like we can sit here and, you know, you know, say cute affirmations all day, right? Like that's the easy part, right? The hard part is really like doing it every day, making it a practice. And so, you know, I'm loving that you have like found this journey and, um, you know, I definitely, definitely, definitely want to thank you for sharing your story for sure. Can we give uh, Noble some hands as well? Yes, yes, yes. I see hands. I see a snap. I snap sometimes. I'm a snapper. <laughs> um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to definitely come back around um, towards the end as well. But I want to hop on to Armand's story. So thank you again, Noble. I appreciate it. All right, Armand. And also, y'all say what up to Dana. Dana's going to go after Armand. Hey, Dana. <laughs> um, Armand. Hello there. You are the one who actually inspired the the entire, you know, trajectory of this evening. <laughs> so, you know, Armand, literally, we hopped on the call. I kid you not. Armand, what'd you say? You said, like, tell me something good or like tell me tell me something inspiring. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah right, right. <laughs> or um, yeah. Um, I'm ready to go. Lead the way, Crystal. Yeah, ready, let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. So yeah. Talk to me. Talk to me. What you hear me? yeah, we can. I'm just making sure you can hear me. That's oh, right. yeah, we can definitely hear you for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Armand, talk to me a little bit about, I know you wanted to kind of talk about um, your childhood coming up, all the different interactions you had. And um, as a child, right, surprise, surprise, Armand actually originally wanted to become a police officer. Right. Let's talk about that. That is, that, that is true. So I got to like really go back. Um, yeah, I, I, like, I, I that really like, was awesome when I heard that. I like, like, I had, like for a while, I had a lot of embarrassment around like me actually wanting to be a police officer. Um, just for those who don't know my story, I did 28 years in prison. Um, I've been out since August um, 2019. And my first interaction with police happened when I was, I hadn't even started school yet. Um, mm -hmm. We was playing cops and robbers. Me and like four neighborhood kids and a couple of my family members. And I ended up cuffing one of my neighborhood friends and I ended up losing the key. So as a result, my parents had to call the, they called the police to take the cuffs off um, the kid. And um, I remember when um, he was leaving, the cops was like, yo, um, if we have to come back here again, um, somebody's going out in real cuff. But they directed it to me because they knew I was the one that cuffed them. And um, the, 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 the thing about that is that um, at that time, I was actually, um, I, I was playing the role of the cop. You know what I'm saying? I was the one that actually arrested him, um, like living out a childhood fantasy of, of being, being a cop, right? And, um, and once he told me that, I basically had no more affection, love, or appreciation um, for police. And, um, I never realized like how that even played an effect on me until I was actually preparing for parole. And 
Um, somebody who I was dealing with who was a social worker, she was, um, she, was a, she was a white woman. And she was telling me, I was telling her about my interaction with the police. And she was like, well, my first interaction was I, I stole the car. So I'm thinking like, damn, there's gonna be some consequences here. She's like, oh no, no, they let me get in the car. They let me pay with the siren. They drove me home and they just gave it to my parents. I was like, you serious? She's like, yeah, that was, that's how I went down to my neighborhood. And um, yeah, so I realized, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, mine was like, mine really wasn't a crime. Like she really committed a crime. And they literally like, just like, oh no, they just acknowledged, they acknowledged she was a kid. I mean, which they should have, right? But I think it should have showed the same um, level of um, um, compassion to me as a yeah. child, as opposed to like threatening me with a, a, a physical arrest. And um, yeah, so that was like one incident, but another incident that I encountered that kind of like molded my, molded my um, life. I remember like it was yesterday, uh, it was May 11th, um, 1989, 1987, excuse me. And, um, and I remember like, I was just walking down the street. I already been involved in the street, like doing bad things as a kid, I already been in the juvenile facilities. I used to get arrested a lot, then released to my parents. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was May 10th, so the, the cops like, just for no reason, they just came and picked me up at 10 o'clock. I'm like, why the hell are they picking me up? I didn't do anything, so I wasn't really worried about it. And then like about, they just, instead of like taking me to the precinct, they like drove me around the neighborhood for a few hours. Um, like, but they picked up other people. And then I was like, why the hell? Is I, I, my mind, I couldn't fathom what was going on. And right when I was going back to the precinct, it was like probably like 12, 30 at night. And the cops was like, yeah, um, yeah, you're going, you're going, you're going with the big boys today. Like, I didn't even realize that it was the eve of my birthday, but the cops had realized it was the eve of my birthday. And they knew at midnight, I'll be turning 16, which would make me an adult. So they literally like arrested me on the eve of my birthday, just to hold me, um, just to hold me to midnight to process me so I could go to Rikers Island. Um, anybody that ever been to New York and know anything, you didn't have to be in prison, you didn't have to be involved in the street life. You know that the Rikers Island was considered like one of the most dangerous places. Yeah, um, if you live in this country yeah. and you don't know Rikers Island, yeah, how, and, just and, go and, consult Google. That's it, that's all yeah. I'm gonna tell you, go and consult Google. Go, and I had to go to C-74, which is the adolescent wing, which was considered the worst and the most dangerous. And they put me in there and I had to go in there and they made sure they arrested me. I think it was like a weekend or something. So I had to actually like stay in there. And they actually told me that they're gonna put me in there so I could get raped, so I could get hurt, so I could learn, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and but nothing happened to me, fortunately, but I would say unfortunately as well, because um, I always fear, I always had a fear of like going to Rackers Island and going to prison. And I was like, once I went in there and nothing happened to me and I navigated it with ease, um, I literally like was embarrassed that I was scared for so many years. To um, mm -hmm. be in the prison setting, and I, I took a, I took a vow like I would never like be afraid or fear mm -hmm. anything again, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and that even like that even like navigated like I mean, I mean like that mm -hmm. even like carried oh. on to, like when I got arrested for this crime, I was like literally when I went to the prisons, I literally was on some, on some turn up mode because mm -hmm. I didn't want to like even if I was scared, I would not let it show. I would actually do the opposite of mm -hmm. um of um what that fear was. But that kind of like bore fruit for me in the um, in the future when I started getting involved in RJ programming. Um, so I, I laugh at anybody. I, I laugh at anybody who says that RJ is soft, because uh, and Noble could tell you this, and Eric, anybody could tell you that did RJ in prison. That there's men in prison right now that don't even want to do RJ. They scared. They rather they could get they could do RJ programming, go to parole, and probably get out. And that's like the only and they would not do it because they're afraid. And um, I remember I went started doing RJ. Can you also give folks another, just refresh folks' minds on um, on that program, on RJ? Okay, so RJ is, is um, um, it's short for like restorative justice programming. Yeah. So while incarcerated, Noble, myself, Eric. Oh, and I gotta give an honorable mention to Bobby. Bobby was supposed to be on this panel tonight. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but Bobby, Bobby's sick. Unfortunately, he have a speedy recovery. And mm -hmm. um, that's the only reason he ain't here. But me, him, Noble, and Eric, we all worked doing RJ work on the inside, where we actually uh, created, led, and did a lot of programming that was RJ centered. So, mm. um, the, one of the first programs I did was something called the Victim Offender Education Group. It's a 34 week intensive program, and you run through everything from your crime. And at the end of the, at, at the end of the process, the 34 week process, you um, have to sit in space with people who are um, survivors of, of violent crime usually mothers of homicide victims um, and the like. So um, like I said, um, and the, re the first time I started doing that programming, um, I was tearing up. I was, 
I was literally like afraid to do it. Yeah. And Why were you afraid? The, Tell us about that. What was, what were you afraid of? I what think um, the reason I was afraid to be honest because when I went in, I, I realized it was, it was bringing up stuff for me. It was making me want to. It was making me want to cry. It was making me feel mad vulnerable. Right, and you're not I, supposed I, to be vulnerable. And yeah, crazy. not only that. Um, anybody that know me from institution had a reputation beyond repute, so I didn't want to be like seen as soft or or mm -hmm. anything. And I, I perceived crying at that time as a, as a, as a and I don't mean to sound male talk as a negative. Yeah, the girl thing that girls boys don't cry. Men don't, yeah. men don't, men don't we're, cry. we're totally stigmatized to think that, right? Absolutely, that you know women you know, are allowed to, to cry and be, you know, emotional and men are not, right? Yeah. yeah. And, but you keep it all bottled in, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? It, it has to come out one way or another. It's going to come out either in tears or anger. Like the emotion is going to come out because you can only keep so much inside. Yeah. The, the, like for me, like the quickest way for me to get into a fight with somebody, if I was, if I, I'd rather fight than cry. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather, I'd rather attack than cry. And, um, yeah, but just me going through that RJ process, I, I realized that everything needs water to grow, even humans. Mm -hmm. And um, I just actually like jumped in it head first. And the reason I jumped in it because it was from that vow that I took before, never to be afraid. The fact that I was scared to do it is what made me do it even more. Mm, I love that, I love that. Talk to me too about, cause I think the emotional side is so important. I think we kind of downplay it a little bit. Um, you know, just being able to feel emotions. Like, I know it feels so basic, but like giving yourself permission to feel emotions, right? Especially, I think as men or folks who have been through the system, right? Like you're just told, like you end up in survival mode and you just, you go, go, go. Like, trust me, I've lived in survival mode and it's like, there's, there's no room for emotion, right? Because you're always hopping from, you know, the next fire to the next fire, right? You're always trying to put out the next fire. So talk to me a little bit about that too. And like, even from a young age, like if folks were to be able to let you feel the emotions, right? In order to just give you a space to just be, again, talk to me about that. Yeah, um, that's like a difficult question to ask from the yeah. answer. However, but I will say that, like we started this meeting today with a grounding. Um, I started doing RJ programming 10 years ago and I've been doing multiple programs. I've been like, this is like my three circles today, but every circle we do with a grounding and, and, and every one we do with a check-in where you have to identify exactly how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I was told that it was foreign to me. It was so foreign to me and the men here that they literally had to give us a paper. Like, yo, these are feelings. These are faces that you can associate with feelings. And, and you had to learn how to identify feelings and, and speak to them. So um, today I could do that. I could, I could never do that before. I was like, I knew I was angry or mad. Then I had to learn that that's not really feelings. Those are, those are secondary emotions or something like that. So yeah, it, it, was, it was a world, but to this day, I could, I could say now that I feel my emotions. I try to express my emotions, try to speak to my emotions and um, try to not let my emotions like govern me or, yeah. or take me off to another path. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you, Armand. I, I don't even, that was a perfect way to just tie it up with a bow. Honestly, that was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I love that because again, it seems so basic y'all like emotions and being able to feel them and being able to just express them and understanding where they're coming from. Right. Again, it feels so basic. And do you understand how incredibly crucial it is? Right. Like, and we do this to, to children, right? Like, like from such a young age, right? Like we tell boys to man up, right? We tell, um, you know, just to get it together, stop crying, right? Like, what are you crying? Like all of those things, they become conditioning that eventually, you know, can't, it's not that it has to lead that way, right? But it can mold you and take you down another path because you're not learning how to regulate your emotions, right? You're not actually tapping in with the actual issue. Like you said, Armand, you're dealing with the secondary emotions, right? Like the anger is an actually like you know the the first thing right there's something underneath it right so I appreciate you tapping into that and just you know speaking on that because I think again it is so important especially with when you're doing like restorative work right that you got to feel something right mm -hmm. you got to know where your feelings are coming from mm -hmm. right yeah. absolutely absolutely yep. Thank, yep. You. thank you thank you thank you absolutely so I'm going to come back to you as well at the end and I'm going to say hey to Dana <laughs> let me see I think you're on mute Dana 
Yeah, it's all good. We just gotta unmute. So give Armand, while Dana is unmuting, give Armand some hands, some some spirit fingers, mm -hmm. whatever you're feeling. If you have a flag, you can wave a flag. <laughs> we appreciate you it. Yeah, I can hear you now, Dana. Hey. What's up? How's it going? How are you feeling? I'm all right. I'm all right. Good, good. So I want to talk to you about the grounding as well. Talk to me about that because I know you know you had a really like awesome experience with grounding recently and um you know I, I think again this is so you know feels so basic talking about your emotions and stuff like that but it directly correlates to you know the prison work it directly correlates to your interactions with police right if police are able to have compassion right if you're able to actually identify where your emotions are coming from right um but Dana tell, tell us your story you want to hear it uh my experience with the police started early Mm -hmm. I come from a big family, small house. Unfortunately, it was it was it's almost like hereditary. Everybody in my family has males wise has been to prison. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like my grandfather, my father, I've watched the police come to my house to get my uncles, things like that. But like, never really had no like good views on the police. Like my family all came from down south and whatever their experience was, I can remember my aunt May used to always tell me like, they don't mean you no good. She would just always say that. And it, it just, it started, like I said, it started early, almost like a dog with newspaper. You ever, you ever roll up a piece of newspaper in front of a dog, just watch him. It's almost like inbred it. But I can remember one day, we was hanging in the projects, just running around, and the police came through and they told us to leave. Like, how old were you, Dana? Uh, I might have been about fourteen. About fourteen. Like, I had other experience with the police, but whenever they came around, like, I would run. Like, my aunt used to always tell me, "Just come home, make it home. I don't care what it is, just come home." Mm -hmm. And I remember we was outside, and the police came around and they told us to get out of here. Like. Go where? We live here, like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we walked off and they came back around and they kind of like bunched us all in and took us in the hallway. Went through the normal procedures, take out everything out your pants. And this had to be about 87, 88. And back then they would make you, you know, do degrading stuff to you, make you take your pants off, do all type of stuff, make you, you know, lift your genitals up and then want to tell you to turn your lip up, like, come on, just little stuff like that, but I remember it was this one specific police, he had, like, a thing with him, he would put his hands on you, and I, you know, I had seen him do it plenty of times to other people, and like I said, they had us in the hallway, and, um, started lecturing us, like, didn't he tell us, like, we live here, like, where do you expect us to go? And he just went down the line. It was about maybe six, seven of us. And he slapped every last one of us as we walked out the door. So from that day, from that day on, like, it was just, I built, like, a real hatred towards the police. And don't get me wrong, not all of them's bad. Just like not all of us is bad. But from that day on, I just didn't, like, and my aunt used to always tell me, like, we would get in, we would literally get beaten. Like, if she heard us tell, if we said to one another, oh, I hate you. Like, we probably could say anything else in the house except that. But I built, like, hatred towards the police for that incident there. And it just, it took years and years. Maybe within the last year where I just, like, started, like, understanding, like, Everybody has a background. Everybody was brought up a certain way. Sometimes it don't be their fault. You know what I mean? Like sometimes some of the shit I did wasn't directly my fault. A lot of it plays back to the things I've been through, the people that also raised me. Yeah. You know, because I that can part right there, Dana. Sorry not to cut you off, but that part right there I wanted to tap into, right? The people that raised you, right? 
you said you heard this from, you know, you said your grandfather, your dad, right? You said your aunts, right? Like, I want folks to understand that there's a legacy here, right? And there is a legacy of police mistreating people of color, especially Black folks in this country, right? So when you say your family's from down South, right? That tells me a lot about their experience, right? And you can only pass down experiences you've had, right? I can't tell you about something I've never been through, right? So they're actually passing down like this legacy, right? And I say that because again, like you said, Dana, right? Not all police are bad, cool. Not all people are bad, cool, right? But it's not about the individual, right? Like even when I like, you know, do police work and stuff like that, it's like, it's not about you, the individual, you know, Joe Schmo, whoever, right? It is the uniform and the institution that you are representing, right? And a lot of people uphold that, right, through their actions. You feel me? So I just wanted to tap in with that, um, Dana, real quick. I didn't mean to cut you off, um, but I just wanted folks to understand, like, there is a legacy here, right? There's a legacy, and it's it's not about the individual. You know what I mean? Like, when people are talking about police, yeah, sometimes it is about that one, you know, a-hole, whoever, right? You know what I mean? But in the same sense, right, the quote-unquote good cops, it's about the institution that you're upholding. So, sorry, Dana, continue. Yeah, so I never really, like, never had like no good opinion on the police like no just didn't care you know just it was bad and like i said i think within the last year or so i've like mellowed down like on my like hatred towards them just because what changed, my, what changed? I don't dwell on it so much. I don't tense up so much. Like, I remember at one point in time, I could see the police and, like, I would really, like, feel a certain type of way mm -hmm. to the point where now I understand what anxiety is. Like, I would really start having, like, anxiety feelings. Like, just want to be removed from anywhere around them. Yeah. Talk to me about that, Dana. What is... um? You know, now that you have the word to describe it, what did that anxiety feel like? Like when the police would pass by, you would get that feeling. Tell me what was going on in your body and in your mind. I mean, you know, there's always a possibility that you, you know, fit the description of some bullshit that you ain't really got nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't even matter. You know what I mean? Or... How did your body feel? Just tense. You know, my heart beating. Just wanting to run you, like... I would always run. Even when I wasn't doing nothing, I would run. Just because. Just because I didn't want to have to be subjected to anything, whether it was physical or just being harassed, yo. And that's what it was. It was like, you know, a lot of police made that, I look at it now as a game. Like, I, I can remember me and my friends being picked up by the police and being brought way to Childstown or South Boston, two, three o'clock in the morning, kicked out the police car and they'll pull off laughing. Like, they know what might happen to us. So, you know, a lot of a lot of it was just it was abuse a game. Of power. Yeah, it was, it was abuse of power. It was our life. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it was just sad. It was sad. And my journey into prison, it really didn't change. It really didn't change my opinion on them mm -hmm. whatsoever. And it's it's funny, I was just sitting here thinking about like what was like my first experience with COs. Mm -hmm. I really didn't look at them as police. And me and Amon met in jail. And I don't know if you remember this, but it was a situation where something happened in the gym or was it the unit? And Amon got into it with a... Uh, I still remember he was the um the CEO from the gym. What was his last name? Brown. I can't remember. It was Brown. It was Brown. Big Brown. Yeah. Big Brown, right? Yeah. And and I remember something happened. I don't know what happened, but I remember they jumped on him, and it was like I might have been in jail a couple of months by then, and didn't even wasn't even realizing that I was still going to go through the same thing I went through on the street with these people. Yeah. 
Right. You didn't correlate that the police were also like in the same lane as the correctional yeah, yeah. officers. It was all the same thing. And by the time I made it upstate, it was like one big game to them. Like the shit that they would do, man. You know what I mean? And a, a lot of it was was racially motivated. Like the majority of the COs, they didn't grow up around black people. They didn't. And you can tell how they act. The same thing that a white con might do, they might just be told something. Oh, don't do that. But being black, you might be subjected to be beat on, locked in, all type of shit, man. And it was, it's crazy that I have it's, a question. Still, it's crazy that it's still going on to this day. Yeah, I have a question for you, Dana. Um... Again, I think we talked about it uh, with Noble a little bit, but the rehabilitation behind bars, how do you rehabilitate in that environment? Well, for me, I can honestly say, like, it begins with self, meaning you got you to gotta come, you got to be willing to change. You got to change the way you think. Mm -hmm. Like, the first time I went to jail, I was 17. I didn't get out till I was 28. I didn't change the way I think because I was in survival mode and I didn't care. In order to survive a lot of things, you you, you have to like you take you, you take on this trait of not caring. Mm -hmm. Because if you care, your feelings you emotions. And, and, you, and you you know you gotta feel something. Yeah, you don't see certain things when when when, when you care. But when you don't care, you see everything. So I didn't change the way I think, and I knew I didn't. And it's sorry to say, I kind of knew I was coming back to prison because I never did nothing to like help myself. There was nothing in jail to help me. Yeah, I was gonna ask, what was, what, what was there, right? Because at the end of the day, right? Like on a real basic level, right? Someone does a crime, they're sent to this facility that's supposed to rehabilitate them, right? In theory, there would be services inside of this, you know, place for you to quote unquote rehabilitate so that when you get out, you have the tools and the resources, right, to not have to go back. Right. But talk to me about that. What was what was available? What wasn't available? Like what would you have needed? Well, when I first went to prison, there was nothing available except maybe GED schooling. And the list was so long that if you got in. It was sheer luck. If you got in, nine times out of ten, you was white. And that's just what it was. Like, it was a bunch of teenagers in a maximum security prison. Mm -hmm. It wasn't It wasn't the way it is now. Not saying that it's ten times better, or even five times better. But, you know, like the programs of Martin them speak about, we didn't have that back then. Mm -hmm. So it was just a survival mode. It wasn't there. It, what would that have been if you had that program back then? What would it have been like for you? What could have I, I, I honestly don't know because I was a hurt kid. Mm -hmm. I was away from my family. You know, and I don't know. I can't even answer it. Answer that question. That's honest. Because That's honest. I didn't care about a whole lot of stuff because I was hurt yeah. by just being there. Wasn't really looking for no help. Didn't want no help. Mm -hmm. I didn't even really know like who I was. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So talk to me um, real quick, um, maybe like the next minute or so, but tell me what, you know, like when you think of, you know, today, right? Dana today, right? What does that, that healing journey look like for you today? You know, like how, yeah. Well, I think I'm coming up on like maybe a good solid 10, 11 months, man. Like taking this this road that I'm on, this transition, man. you know what I mean? Just trying to do better for me. Like mm -hmm. I used to say I wanted to do better for my son, wanted to do better for my mother, wanted to do better for my family. And Honestly speaking, I was just trying to make them happy. 
even though I wasn't happy. Mm. And going through this transition right now, like, I can honestly say, like, I don't have, like, real happy days. Because I'm looking, I'm like a deer caught in headlights. Mm. My whole life, I live my life the way I wanted to. And not saying that everything I did was was so bad. But just, you know, my trials and tribulations brought me to where I was at. And about seven, eight months ago, uh, Amon introduced me to Everyday Boston. And, you know, I prejudged it. <laughs> I, I really did, you know. It's natural, it's natural, we all do Walking it. down, Amon was lying, you know, about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he's a liar. I just didn't believe it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this is bullshit. But I stuck <laughs> around. I, I really did, and I gave it my all, man. You know? And me and the mom, we met under, you know, hard circumstances. You know? Under a bad situation. We formed a good friendship. And I can honestly say, without everyday Boston right now, I don't know what I would be doing. And I'm just being honest about it because I wasn't like looking, I wasn't looking at my life the way I'm looking at it now. Like wanting to make a change within myself so I can make a change within the people around me. Because I got a whole bunch of nephews, I got a 15 year old son, and I can see the same traits in them like I can see in their fathers and me. And at some point in time, man, like it, it, it has to stop. Mm -hmm. And it's messed up to say what I got. All together, like six nephews, including my son. If you do the numbers, like, it's guaranteeing at least two of them go to prison. And what happens if you intercept them? What happens? Yeah. If you do that work, like you said, if you do that self work, right? And then you're able to love on them, right? And you're able to kind of like, you know what I mean? Like, what does that look like? Are you? Do you think you're going to be able to intercept them? Because I, I, I honestly don't know. Like, for instance, my nephew, he lost his father. He mm -hmm. lost his brother to gun violence. And he doesn't cry. He's 16. Like, mm -hmm. that's not normal. Mm -hmm. My other nephew, his mother's gone what she's going through. And he don't know nothing else but the streets. I can only I can only say so much. I can only do so much. Mm -hmm. Like and it's 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 a hurtful situation to see them go through what they're going through. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's it's almost like I'm helpless. Are you helpless, or are you, or do you have to do your self work and and just understand that you can only control so much? I can only control so much, like. I can't pay him to do good. Yeah. And that's, you know what I mean? Always giving them, giving them, giving them, bribing them to do this, bribing them to do that. They be cool for a week. Next week, they right back to doing the same thing. So it's like, I don't know what to do. Like, Let me ask you a question, Dana. Um, I know we're like running low on time. Let me ask you a question. What are, if in a perfect world, right? Talk to me, like in a perfect world, what are like the top three things that you think, you know, young black teenage boys need? For one, to, to communicate, to learn how to talk. Mm. Just to learn how to hold a, a conversation. It means a lot to be able to, to express yourself. Yeah. Two, Someone to, man, help them shape and mold their dreams and goals. Third, I don't know. I don't know. All right, those two are awesome. Those two are awesome. Can y'all give Dana some, some hands? Like, yeah, because that was awesome. That was absolutely awesome, right? Someone to communicate with, right? Someone to help them actually shape their dreams and goals, right? Dana, you told me, right? Like you need a dream you need a goal right like even if, if even if you're not if you never achieve it right but just to have that dream to say like okay like that's the first step is to just have the dream right like we're not even worrying about like can you get to it right 
do you have an idea of what the dream is, right? Like there are so many folks running around without, you know, anything like that, right? So um, that I think that was perfect, Dana. That was absolutely perfect. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. I know it's seven o'clock and um, we are gonna wrap up. I just wanna say, first of all, thank you to all three of these men. And I wanna actually, if we can care, if I can take like two minutes. <laughs> um, I wanna ask, um, you know, we can maybe go, we can start with Noble and go Armand and come back to you, Dana, so you can you can think, maybe take a, a drink of water. Um, <laughs> um, but Noble, what, you know, and I like the number three, so if you can't think of three, it's all good, but I just like number three, but what are the top three things that you want folks to take away from your story from this evening? You know, what do you want? What do you want folks to take away from from this, this event this evening? Um, just my like my story shouldn't be common. So I like find a way to not make my story exist no more. Mm. And um a second uh, um partnership because um I'm not looking for charity. Partnership is that you getting in the mud doing the work with me. Yeah. And um just more um empathy. Right. Once you start to see me or you see me and your child or your friend, and then maybe you could we could work together and. So empathy look like putting yourself in my shoes. Yeah. Those, those be the three things I'm looking for. Awesome. Take away from this. Absolutely, absolutely. I love it. Thank you, thank you. It's a partnership. I like that too, right? That, you know, some folks just need a like partnership, right? Like let's do this together, right? Like no, none of us are an island. So absolutely. Where'd you go, Armand? Sorry, all the, the, the things are changing on me. Armand, that you are. Um, same thing for you. What are the top three things, if you can think of three, um, that you want folks to take away from this evening? Um, I think uh, the the number one thing that I want people to take away is that, like, if you look at myself, you look at Noble, you look at Dana, um, I know all of them incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, I know all of them the repetition for the streets. None of them was quote unquote angels, but um, they, they, we all was hurt, hurt, hurt people, hurting people. I mean, so it's about having a level of um, empathy for people who are hurting and, and not, not being so quick to throw people away. Mm -hmm. um, like the prison I was in was Norfolk prison. Mm -hmm. That's a prison that me, Noble, and Eric worked in. And that prison had the largest population of lifers. Mm -hmm. um, the oldest population, but that had the, they had the most powerful um, leaders in there. I wouldn't be here today um, had I not gone to that prison. I literally did 28, 22 of my 28 years in maximum security prison. And I didn't start changing until I actually went there. Mm -hmm. um, these lifers held my hand, they walked me out, and none of them are coming out. Yeah. None of them are coming out. I mean, only reason I'm out because they made sure they modeled, they modeled leadership for me. They walked me, they literally like held my hand, like, yo, you're going to this school, you're going to this program tomorrow. But um, yeah, but a lot of them, they, they don't get second chances. Uh, were it not for the change in the law on juvenile brain development, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be here. Um, you got kids in prison. Like Dana said, me and Danny were the two youngest guys in the whole prison. Mm. With a bunch of old ass dudes, lifers. I mean, like just known killers, like been down for 30, 40 years. They've been down longer than we've been alive and we in the same prison with them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and, uh, and uh, like I said, and for, two, and for two decades, all they taught me was how to be worse. Mm. I always say that when I, when I went to Norfolk, I already believed that I was on my way to be the greatest gangster ever. And I was cool with that. Mm -hmm. I really was cool with that until like um restorative justice interrupting the process. Yeah. yeah so I, would just say that. I would just say um um support people when they come home. Yeah. Um that's one thing I love about everyday Boston. The first I, I wasn't out for more than two hours. I got a call from district attorney office that was making that was working on behalf of Kyra to get me enrolled in the um bridge project um and put money in my pockets. I wasn't even out two hours yet. So to me, that's like a model. I want to be able to do that with the transformation of prison project. There's a lot of guys inside who basically they run the RJ programming on the inside. Um, and they put they literally put their life on the line to do programming because a lot of people don't look at them in, in a good light. The only reason I was able to do the work, no was able to do the work, even they were able to do the work because we had, like I said, we had reputation beyond repute. And we could do it and do like, okay, they doing it, they serious, don't mess with them. But people's lives actually get threatened doing this work to yeah. say. To save, to save our own kind, so yeah. Um, so it would feel good to be able to come home and have a landing, a landing pad, and to be able to do work. You know what I mean? So like, for first, like seven months I was home, I just had a part-time job 
with um with, with Tara at Everyday Boston and with um C4RJ doing work. And they both actually took into account the work that I did on the inside and saw value in my experience. Mm. And nobody else did. And I did it based solely on my prison resume. Can I say that one more time, Armand? You're cutting out, go for it. Oh, sorry. I said people people inside have a lot of skill sets that are transferable to society, especially when it comes to RJ facilitating tutoring in the most hostile environments you could do and be successful. It's, it's, it's making a cake you could do it out here. Oh, but that's a piece of cake out here. That's given, the opportunities are not given, and people, and people were hindered, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm going to come back around to you, Dana. Top three things that you want folks to take away from, you know, your story. What do you want folks to know? Give us the top three. Go for it. Top three? Yeah. I think one would be that I appreciate that y'all take the time and actually care. Two, I want to say thank you. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate it. The comments, just the, just the gesture of showing that somebody cared. I was taking a class a couple of weeks ago and I met Paul Yukas. He's on here tonight. And this man has called me. I don't know this man. Mm-hmm. And like, he's really reached out. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel good, but it also like, it scares me. And you shouldn't be scared of somebody trying to help you. Yeah. You shouldn't. Yeah. Sorry. It's all good, Dana. Dana, you can look at me, right? Just take a deep breath and then exhale. Like, like I said, like I know I'm struggling. Like I can't find a job to save my life, yo. Ask for what you need, Dana. There are how many people on this call? Right? There are seventy-four people on this call right now. So, what do you need? Just a chance. That's about it. Yeah. Look at that. Georgina said, it's all good. Strong men cry. Look how strong you are right now. Give Dana some fingers, y'all. Give him some some love, some spirit, some energy. Love you, bro. Yeah, we do. We do. We love you. We're proud of you, right? You know, we see you. Everyone on this call sees you, right? Look, I see hearts. Everyone's putting up their hearts for you, right? That's why I said, ask for what you need, right? Folks are saying thank you for sharing your heart and your tears. I okay. want to say thank you to Kara too. Like, yeah. For her to be a white woman. Like, <laughs> a whole white woman. Yeah. <laughs> we love her. <laughs> like we meet, we, we go for walk and it's like, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but you know, I just want to say thank you. Like she's made a difference. But even you, Crystal, like, you saved me the other day and you don't even realize it. Like, mm-hmm. like I said, like, you're worthy. I'm you're still, worthy and like, you're deserving. I'm still really struggling. Just, I've never been emotional neither. Mm-hmm. Like, never. This is new. Never. Like, mm. I don't know. But yeah. No, we appreciate it. Y'all give Dana some more love. Give Dana some more love. Everyone in the comments is giving you all the love, Dana, all the love. Absolutely. Um, and also to Kara, I don't know if um, there's an easy way for folks to get in contact with all of them or folks should just reach out to Everyday Boss and get to get in contact with the guys in case folks want to, you know, partner with Noble, right? You know, help Armand, you know, with his new, listen, Armand is on a whole nother situation right now, right? <laughs> you know, help Dana, you know what I mean? Find a job and, you know, um, just give them opportunities. So I don't know if that's the best way. Um, I lost you, Carol, I don't know where she went, but um, yeah. folks just reach yeah. out to Everyday Boston if that's the best way. Yeah, yeah, I would say um, that that Armand and, um, and Noble and Bobby and Eric, um, you can reach them all at the Transformational Prison Project. So, um, cause that, that's the main thrust of the work. You can reach Dana through Everyday Boston. Um, and Dana, I just wanna say that you are a gift to me through and through. Yeah. 
Um, I just want to tell a small little story that recently my 17 year old dog passed away. You know, was, she was my sidekick and, uh, you know, Dana was on the phone with me, like texting me. Have I, have I, you know, had soup yet today? Have I eaten? Is everything okay? Can I, you know, like, this is who I have in my life just because, um, me, you know, really because he reached out to me. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that everyone, um, gets lucky, um, as I have to meet men, um, people like the men on this call, um, Dana and, and Noble and Armand and Bobby and Eric and all these, all and Derek out there and Steve and George and all the, you know, they're, um, so please reach out, please. Um, you can email me Kara at everydayboston.org. Um, also in the comments, um, Eric, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Um, put, uh, Armand's email, Noble's email, um, as well. Transform prison uh, dot org yeah. as well. Um, yeah, please definitely reach out. You know, we want to, you know, make all the connections, right? Yes. You know, I always say, listen, Dana's the one who, listen, Dana again, being a gift, said you're only as big as your circle, right? Yeah. And so right now, currently, we have a circle of 74. So, you, you know, so I, I want our circle to, um, and Dana, I don't know if you want to uh, throw your email in there as well. I'm not sure if you have an email with them as well, but throw that in the chat. Um, but again, you're only as big as your circle, right? And so we want to lean on this circle, right? All y'all showed up this evening for a reason. Right. Whether you do this work already, whether you, you want to help, whether you have the resources to help. Right. Sometimes that looks like financial. Right. Sometimes that looks like, you know, someone to listen to. Right. Like what Dana was talking about. We just we just chatted for like an hour. Right. And sometimes that's what folks need. Right. An ear to listen, you know, someone to just give them a space to be right. You know, give them a job if you can. Right. All those things like like Armand said. You know, these guys come in back, you know, a lot of times you get stigmatized, right? Because of what, what's on your record, right? But you've got to look past that and realize, like Armand said, folks have transferable skills, right? A lot of transferable skills, right? I even, I mean, to take it a step further, and I'm going to end this in just a minute, but take it a step further. I look at all, you know, the guys, you know, who used to be on the block, this and that, like the math skills that it takes. You know what I mean? Like, so imagine you turn, you move in bricks, right? Now you move in, you know, legal things, you feel me? So imagine, you know what I mean? There are transferable skills, right? And also a little extreme, you know, um, example. But again, you know, look at folks and just look at what the skills that they have that can be transferable. Don't just look at, uh, you know, a record, a stamp on a record or whatever. You know what I mean? Because if you looked at these guys, maybe on paper, you might pass them over, right? But when you listen to them, you see their story. You know what I mean? Like you gotta, you gotta be able to have that compassion for others, right? So I just encourage folks to take that with you. I encourage y'all to take the grounding exercise that we did in the beginning with you as well. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Kara. Um, oh, also in the chat, if y'all want to go um, grab everyone's emails, Dana's emails in there as well, um, and Armand and Noble. Um, so definitely grab that before we end this. But again, I want to thank everyone for being here. I appreciate y'all. Thank you to all three of these beautiful souls that told their story. Give them some, some fingers one more time, y'all, if you can, a flag, whatever. <laughs> Can I say something real quick? Please. Yes. yes. My name is Demi, and I was listening to the gentleman's story about what he went through when he was locked up. I just wish I had my son here because I have a 23-year-old. He's He doesn't get into any trouble or any of that, but I needed him to hear exactly what was he, what he was going through. Mm -hmm. And what he was saying, it, it touched me, you know what I mean? But I just sent him all the prayers, all the prayers that it is. Yeah. I just sent him all the prayers. Yeah. And just tell him everything's going to be OK. Yeah. Just keep praying. He's going to be fine. Yeah, we That's all him. I wanted to say. I just wish I had my son here so he can hear what he was saying. Because it really touched me. I have a 23-year-old. And I thank yeah. God that he's not in the streets mm -hmm. like the other kids are. You know what I mean? He's in That's school. He's job. working. Yeah. And I just try to keep his head on his shoulder. You got to just keep doing what you got to do. Don't gather up with any of your body. Just hang out by yourself. Yeah. Now it's to the point where he don't go nowhere. He's a homebody. Go mm -hmm. to work and he comes back home. I just wish he was here so I can let him hear this guy's story. 
because it was very touching. Well, you know what? All of their emails are in the chat. Like I said, um, you know what I mean? Everyone, please grab the emails. I'll give y'all another minute to grab the emails um, as well as the transformprison.org. That's where you can also reach out as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Demi, for sharing that as well. And all the best to your son. Again, thank you to Armand. Thank you to uh, Noble. Thank you to Dana. Thank you so much, Dana, for sharing and being raw. And, you know, you're helping folks, right? All three of y'all are helping folks, um, you know, folks here tonight, folks who are going to take this and, and again, continue to do this work. You spark so much in folks. And again, that's why I say, ask for what you need and, you know, you, you shall receive, right? You had 75 people on this call um, when I've looked, right? So I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all. And, I think that is it, Kara. We did a thing and Thank have a good, good night, job. everyone. Yes, Thank I appreciate you. you. Yes. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Be safe. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.